Hello, I'm Carrie Brown, and I'm a Senior Medical Director at Immune Therapeutics. It's wonderful to be part of the Contains Courage Research Retreat. I look forward to joining the general session and learning from all the speakers at this event. I have the opportunity today to share with you data on the modulation of immune responses and clinical outcomes during longer-term oral immunotherapy with PTAH and patients with peanut allergy. 2020 has been a challenging year for us all. How we all experience daily life has changed. I want to take a second to focus on a success which was realized in 2020 for the food allergy community, the first FDA approval for a food allergy treatment. The food allergy community was critical on the journey. Even before a key meeting held in 2011, academic food allergy researchers pioneered the way with the initial studies of oral immunotherapy. Many in the audience are aware, and some are even probably part of the meeting in 2011, hosted by the Food Allergy Initiative of multiple members of the food allergy community, including patient advocates, leaders in the food allergy research field, members of FDA, NIH, and they all came together to identify a path forward for development of a food allergy therapeutic. Allergen Research Corporation was established the same year. The phase two study of ARA 101 began in 2014, and the phase three pivotal study began in 2015. Allergists contributed to these studies as investigators and patients and families committed to participation in the studies, which were key to gain the data that were needed to move forward on the journey. In 2018, a biologic license application was submitted and a marketing authorization application was submitted to the EMA in 2019. At the FDA Advisory Committee meeting in 2019, multiple patients and their families who have been part of the clinical studies spoke about the impact that oral immunotherapy had on their lives in the open public hearing. Many individuals were involved on this path to approval this year. With an approved treatment for food allergy, there is increasing interest in investing in this field. Investments into the development of food allergy therapeutics by large corporations can help provide greater resources to achieve the aim of improving the lives of those with food allergies and increase the awareness of food allergy. So in 2020, we have the initial approved treatment for food allergy. We all likely agree that we are eager to see in the coming years how the contributions of the field lead to additional advancements which directly impact patients. So as some may not be familiar, I'll start by defining PTAH, which is an abbreviation for the generic name, peanut ericus hypogea, allergen powder DNFP. Many are more familiar likely with AR101, which is the name when it was an investigational treatment. PTAH is an oral immunotherapy indicated for the mitigation of allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, that may occur with accidental exposure to peanut in individuals 4 to 17 years. So as participants treated with PTAH enter treatment beyond the first year and gain longer-term exposure, we're able to observe over time immune modulation which occurs and the corresponding change in clinical and safety outcomes within the participant cohorts. One such cohort of participants are those who initiated PTAH treatment in Palisade and continued daily maintenance dosing in ARC-4. The data I'm presenting today comes from a cohort of participants 4 to 17 years of age who were treated with PTAH in Palisade and continued in the open label follow-on study, which is ARC-4. So many are familiar with the results of Palisade, which was a phase three international double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And it enrolled participants from North America, Europe, aged four to 55 years to receive PTAH or placebo for up to 12 months. The primary analysis population consisted of participants aged four to 17 years of age. The Palisade study demonstrated the benefit of once daily OIT with PTAH uh, resulting in desensitization, which was defined as the increase in the participant's ability to tolerate increased amounts of peanut protein during a blinded food challenge. Now, there were participants treated with placebo and palisade who entered ARC-4 and were updosed and entered a maintenance period of dosing. There were also participants who were either older than 17 years of age or on non-daily dosing regimens in ARC-4. This analysis we're talking about today does not include data from these participants, only those who were age 4 to 17 of years of age on PTAH and Palisade and continued ARC-4 on daily dosing. So if we refer to the diagram on the slide, starting with the orange box, we see uh, participants um, enter Palisade, at which point their baseline assessments were completed. They underwent updosing for approximately six months of 300 milligram daily dosing, at which point they underwent the Palisade exit assessments and were eligible for enrollment into ARC-4. Now, there were two groups of participants who entered ARC-4 and continued on daily dosing. There were 110 participants in Group A who continued on 300 milligram daily dosing in ARC-4 for an additional 28 weeks, which would be about a total of a year and a half PTAH treatment before exiting ARC-4. And then there's 32 participants in Group B who completed an additional 56 weeks of daily dosing in ARC-4, 
which resulted in about two years of total PTAH treatment before exiting ARC-4 and undergoing exit assessments. And then as mentioned, a portion of the participants entered ARC-4 and entered either non-daily dosing cohorts or initiated treatment with PTAH, and these participants are not included in the analysis today. So let's start by looking at the change in markers of peanut sensitization that occur during the two-year period of treatment with PTAH. So on the left, we have peanut-specific IgE plotted over time. The time points on the x-axis are baseline at palisade screening at the completion of updosing after six months of maintenance at the exit of palisade and at the time of exit from ARC-4 following a total period of two years of treatment for those in group B. The blue line is group A who received a year and a half of treatment and the orange line is group B who received two years of total treatment. So if we look at the graph on the left, we see we start with elevated baseline values. There's a pattern as we would expect with allergen immunotherapy and, and that has been reported with other food allergy OIT where initially there is rise in allergen specific IgE. We can see here that following the first six months of dosing, there is a steady decline in values approach a baseline following approximately a year of exposure and they continue to decline in both groups. The data suggests that there's a continual decline in peanut specific IgE through two years of treatments. Participants exiting ARC-4 were able to enter an additional follow-on study from which we hope to be able to gain further insight into the change in immunologic markers beyond two years. And as we gather this long-term data beyond two years of treatment, it'll be interesting to see whether there is a continued trend down beyond the two-year time point. On the right, we have the peanut skin prick test mean wheel diameter plotted over the same time period. And we can see a steeper decline in the first six months of treatment and then a leveling off in both groups. Next, looking at peanut-specific IgG4 over time in the left-hand graph, we see a steady increase over the time period from initiation of treatment to completion of updosing into a year of treatment. Beyond that first year of treatment, there's a continued increase in values in both groups through exit from ARC-4, with a suggestion that additional increase is seen beyond a year and a half of treatment. On the right-hand side, we see the peanut-specific IgE to IgG4 ratio is graphed over time. There is a sharp decrease in the ratio through updosing with a continued decline during the first six months of maintenance and then leveling off in the second year of treatment. Now let's look at efficacy, which was assessed by blinded food challenges. Now these results are assessed over the same time period during which biomarkers were collected. The data is from the completer population, so participants would have needed to undergone the ARC4 exit food challenge to be in this analysis. On the y-axis, we have the percentage of subjects tolerating a given dose level with no more than mild symptoms in the blinded uh, challenge to peanut protein. These do not represent uh, cumulative doses, but rather dose levels. So on the x-axis, there are two different time points of assessment. So we have on the left, the challenge and palisade after approximately 12 months of treatment. And on the right side is at the time of ARC-4 exit, approximately after a year and a half of exposure in group A. And then in group B, the ARC-4 exit challenge was completed after approximately two years of treatment. So the blue bar represents the 300 milligram dose level, the orange bar, the 600 milligram dose level, the gray bar, the 1000 milligram dose level. And then there's also a yellow bar in the ARC-4 data. There was a 2000 milligram dose level administered for the exit from ARC-4, which was not done in Palisade. In general, we see an increase in the percentage of participants who tolerate a given dose level over time. For example, if we look at the 1,000 milligram dose level represented by the gray bar, we see in both groups that exit from Palisade that approximately 65% tolerate the 1,000 milligram dose level. After an additional six months of treatment, this increases to 79.7% in group A. And after two years of total treatment in group B, this increases to 96.2% of participants who underwent the challenge. So now if we look at the 2,000 milligram dose level represented by the yellow bar, in group A, 48% of participants tolerate this dose level after a year and a half of treatment, while 80.8% of participants who underwent the challenge tolerated the 2,000 milligram dose level after two years of treatment. And this data overall suggests that for those who continue treatment, there's an increase in the amount of peanut protein which is tolerated during a blinded challenge. Let's move on and look to the high level adverse event profile over the same time period. So we can see group A on the left and group B on the right. For each group, there are multiple columns showing the different time periods. So the right rates during Halisade initial dose escalation and updosing is the first column in each group. That's approximately the first six months of treatment 
The middle column is the rate during the second six months of treatment, which participants are on daily 300 milligram dosing in Palisade. And the last column is the rate during the daily maintenance dosing in ARC-4, which is six months longer in group B than it is in group A. So first, if we look at participants with at least one A, AE. This is related and unrelated. We see that in both groups, um, over time, there is a decrease in the percentage of participants experiencing at least a 1 AE over time. Next, if we look at the serious AEs. So in general, the serious AEs were infrequent. We can see that there were two here, one in maintenance dosing period and one in the ARC-4 maintenance dosing period. If we look next at the participants with one or more treatment-related AEs, over time, again, we see a decrease in the number of participants um, reporting that. So, for instance, in the Group A cohort, we have 79.1 participants in um, up-dosing in IDE, 44.5 in maintenance dosing, and 42.7 in ARC-4. So, next we look at the, the total exposure time in participant years. So, it's important to note that in each of these columns, there's a little bit of change in the amount of exposure time. So in order to account th for this in these calculations, we, we looked at the total exposure of participant years. So you can see that the most exposure is in that ARC-4 maintenance dosing period. So next, if we look at the exposure adjusted event rate for the number of AEs. So this is calculated by looking at the total number of events divided by the total number of participant years at risk during the period. So we see here in Group B during Palisade IDE and updosing, 82.7 versus 31.8 versus 17.5. And lastly, if we look at the treatment-related AEs and look at the exposure-adjusted event rates, again, we see a decline over time period in these rates. So if we look at, again, at Group B, we see an IDE and updosing, 56.6, down to 21.4, and down to 4.7. So overall, we see a decrease in AE rates over the two years on treatment, with the most pronounced decrease uh, appearing to be with the exposure-adjusted um, related AEs. Let's move on to another important assessment, which was collected over this time period, quality of life. So the change in quality of life was assessed by two tools, the Food Allergy Quality of Life Questionnaire and the Food Allergy um, Independent Measure. So before I get into the data here, I do want to openly acknowledge that I'm going against all Presentation 101 guidelines, which recommends against busy data slides and small text that audiences can't read. So before you zone me out, hang in there for a second. The purpose of this slide is to really observe the overall trend in the domain scores for these quality of life assessments. So many of you are extremely familiar with these tools. But in short, to refresh our memories, the FAQLQ examines the effect of restrictions and the psychosocial effects caused by food allergy. The FAME assessments look at the future expectations associated with accidental exposure and ingestion of allergen by the individual with a food allergy, including the likelihood of ingestion, severity of potential reactions, and the likelihood of successful treatment by self or others. So both instruments use a seven-point scale for which in general a score of one indicates Minimal impairment and a score of 7 indicates maximal impairment, so greater scores uh, represent more impairment. And a change in score of 0.5 or more is considered to represent a minimum clinical important difference. Food allergy-related quality of life was assessed at the screening and end-of-trial visits by use of the age-appropriate uh, instruments and they were completed by participants and caregivers when appropriate. On the top half of this slide, we have self-reported scores for 8 to 12-year-olds, and on the bottom, we have self-reported scores for 13 to 17-year-olds. On the left, group A, and on the right, group B. The score for the assessments are on the y-axis. You can see then the individual columns on the x-axis. So the total score all the way on the left, and then scores for individual questions um, are grouped. The blue bar represents the score at baseline. Orange is a score at the time of Palisade exit, and gray is the score at the time of ARC-4 exit. So given some time and space constraints, we don't have all of the quality of life data here that we had gained in the trial, but there is a manuscript in preparation which does include more data and goes more deeply into this. But what we see in general is that there is a decrease in scores over time from screening baseline to ARC-4 exit. So that you almost see a step pattern in the bars with the blue baseline bar being greater than the orange that is generally greater than the gray for most of these domains. So this suggests that there is a trend in improvement in quality of life over this time period of a year and a half or two years of treatment. So let's drill down into two of the questions on the FAME assessment, which may be of particular interest if we think about the intent of treatment with PTAH 
They are also the domains in which showed greatest improvement over this treatment time period in participants and caregivers. So the two questions are, how great do you think the chances that you will have a severe reaction if you accidentally eat something to which you are allergic? And how great do you think the chances that you will die if you accidentally eat something to which you are allergic? On the slide, we have data from the 13 to 17 year old participants in group A on the left and group B on the right. Self-report is on top and caregiver report on the bottom. So if we zoom in here, we see the trend in decreasing scores over time in each of these groups, suggesting improvement in food allergy related quality of life over these time periods, and particularly in these domains, which are related to external exposure risks. It is interesting that we see these particular uh, two domains showing the greatest improvement over this treatment time period as it was also observed in the phase three PTAH study in European children, the Artemis trial, from which results were recently published that these two mains also showed uh, marked improvements when you compared the baseline to the exit from the trial. The Palisade study and the subsequent ARC4 follow-on study allow for a rigorous evaluation of the modulation of immune responses efficacy, safety, and quality of life changes which occur with peanut oral immunotherapy with PTH during up to two years of treatment. In summary, immunomodulation continues to evolve over the first two years of daily dosing with PTAH. Peanut-specific IgE falls below baseline in the second year. Peanut-specific IgG4 levels rise through the second year. Efficacy of PTAH appears to continue to increase in the second year of therapy, while adverse event profiles continue to improve through the second year of therapy. Finally, clinically meaningful improvements in food allergy-related quality of life over time suggest a link between increased desensitization and improved quality of life and warrant further investigation. This analysis allowed for comparison of longer-term clinical outcomes over time with insights into the underlying immune modulation and interrelated clinical effects seen by longer-term OIT with PTAH. These data support the concept that the biological effects of the desensitization process coincide with clinical responses. In conclusion, ongoing longer-term oral immunotherapy treatment with a well-characterized and consistent peanut allergen source shows continued immunomodulation and clinical improvement in efficacy and safety over time. No longer-term follow-up will be needed to determine if disease modification also occurs. We want to acknowledge the participants and families who chose to be part of uh, these studies investigating PTH. Thank you. And the dedicated investigators and site staff, you're key to all of this as well. With that, I'll wrap up my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and share data today. And I look forward to the panel discussion where I will answer any questions you may have.